an essential part of regulating the U.S. capital markets in general and the stock market in particular is the vigorous enforcement of securities laws. On one hand, statistics from the Securities and Exchange Commission indicate that enforcement actions hit a 10-year high in 2011. On the other hand, the number of cases involving financial statement and accounting fraud has steadily declined over the past decade. But is there an increased interest in financial reporting by the securities regulator? A recent speech by Howard Scheck, the sh chief accountant in the SEC's Enforcement Division, reminded financial executives that financial statement and accounting fraud remain, quote, a core focus, end quote, for the commission. With us is Marta Alfonso, a principal in the Management Services Department at the accounting firm MBAF. Thanks for joining us this month, Marta. Mike, thank you so much for the opportunity. Now, let me ask you a baseline question. On the one hand, we've heard that all government agencies have to do more with less. But on the other hand, there was an increase in SEC enforcement resources after the Madoff scandal, wasn't there, Marta? I think that you saw the government be quite serious about their responsibilities in enforcement with increasing resources at the SEC. There had been a push in the recent years to try to do more in that area, and I think that Madoff probably gave them the impetus to be able to obtain the budget authority to do so. But I think that as financial statements and accounting issues become more global and more complex, I think you will see more resources in that area. Of course, I've just seen reports of recent speeches by the head of the SEC's Enforcement Division and others. And he says that financial fraud, particularly disclosure and reporting issues, are a top examination priority. So tell me, is that just something the Commission says after every downturn in the stock market? You know, Mike, it, it's not. I, I think the SEC takes their enforcement role pretty seriously. They have a whole department that's dedicated to the review of those financial statements. They write fairly detailed comment letters to all of your clients um, and to their uh, registrants about issues that they see in the financials. In speaking with SEC uh, officials, they are very clear that they're going to stay on uh, tracking down and prosecuting fraud. I don't think that's going to change. In fact, I think that um, you're going to see more and more examples of that. Um, I think they want to keep that profile uh, of going after what they perceive as fraud uh, in, in the registrant community, so I don't see that changing. Are you surprised that the Commission is focusing on fraud and revenue recognition? I mean, are there particular areas of accounting irregularities in which the SEC is especially interested? Yes, Mike, I, I think there are. Uh, I think starting at the top of their list is valuations, valuations of complex financial instruments like derivatives, valuations of intangible assets are, are a big topic for them. Well, that makes sense. What other financial reporting topics are of interest to the Commission these days? Yes, there are. Um, there's purchase price accounting. Uh, the area of revenue recognition, uh, and the traditional areas of bill and hold type transactions, uh, channel stuffing, uh, the timing of uh, transactions with service agreements, all of those are traditional areas of interest. The last big one, I'd say, is dealing with foreign subsidiaries and the accounting and internal controls surrounding those types of relationships between a parent and a sub. Of course, there are some areas where the SEC shares enforcement authority with the Department of Justice. Now, I'm thinking specifically of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. We're seeing a lot of activity in connection with anti-bribery in general and the FCPA in particular, aren't we? There's increased activity by the Department of Justice because business is much more global than it ever has been. I think there's a lot more cooperation amongst governments to identify illegal conduct that's occurring, and I think that's an important trend. So when you have all the governments working together, it becomes easier to identify and detect illegal practices. I think a lot of companies in the United States and from abroad into the United States are looking for ways to um, optimize their uh, costs of, of doing business. And so for, our, for companies going outside, it's, it's an appeal to try to do things in foreign, company, in foreign countries on a more cost-effective basis or expand their market. But in doing so, I think what the Justice Department is looking for are making sure that we are not subjecting uh, our companies and our business practices to conduct that's considered illegal. And so they're really, really pushing and holding officers of companies accountable, not just the conduct at a company level, 
but holding individual officers accountable to make sure that the right controls are in place to avoid that type of conduct. As you think about the SEC's agenda in connection with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, Marta, tell me, does the uptick in FCPA enforcement actions necessarily mean that people have become greedier or that companies aren't doing a good enough job in educating their managers in this area? I think it's learning how to do business on a global scale. I think part of the, the challenge that we have is in the United States, because of our common business practices and the infrastructure we have to support those practices, people naturally think that when you go to another country that the business practices and the relationships are the same. And oftentimes they're not. The cultures are different, the ways that they do business are different, the laws are different. And so the attractiveness of going to a new co country might be that they believe that the cost of doing business is going to be cheaper, but certainly at the beginning you've got to invest time and effort to really understand what is going on in that foreign country and to be able to train the people that are going to represent you over there in the conduct of what occurs in the United States, what's required under our laws, as well as when you're there, how they represent your company. Over the past decade, since the enactment of Sarbanes-Oxley, most companies have focused a lot of attention and a lot of resources on their internal controls. So from your perspective, Marta, how effective have those controls been in connection with areas like bribery? I think there are companies that certainly have a great infrastructure and they've been able to propagate that infrastructure in the control area across the world. But there are many companies that are still learning how to do that. I think that's an area that still has an opportunity to develop and grow. Uh, and, and, you know, part of the enforcement activities of the Justice Department will prompt the continued maturity of foreign controls in, in those types of situations. I've been asking questions about the SEC's interest in companies, such as our viewers. But isn't there also an obligation, Marta, for auditors under Section 10A to report illegal acts they detect to the SEC? Mike, there is, and they take that role very seriously. I think that it, it is a significant uh, responsibility that the internal auditors have because they understand that it is, a, it is a privilege to practice in front of the SEC. There is no guaranteed right. And in fact, you see in many cases with the uh, enforcement releases that they, that they release, that they do go after accountants and they will preclude them from practicing in front of the SEC. So you are uh, standing in some responsible shoes when you are actually practicing and providing audit services. So I, I think that you will see that, that accounting firms continue to take that very seriously. I think the PCAOB also, who um, regulates the accounting professionals, also looks for high quality and demands integrity. And so that in, in the event that those situations don't occur, uh, the SEC will make their displeasure known and seek to bar certain people from practicing. Thanks, Marta. We'll return to your commentary in a minute. The Securities and Exchange Commission recently filed suit in a Massachusetts federal court against JBI Inc., a Canadian company that claims to be able to convert waste plastic into clean burning oil. The SEC alleges that the company, along with its current CEO and its former CFO, engaged in a scheme to commit securities and accounting fraud by reporting materially false and inaccurate financial information. According to the Commission, JBI, during the third and fourth quarters of 2009, materially overstated certain assets in an effort to bolster its balance sheet and success in two private capital raising efforts known as Private Investment in Public Equity, or PIPES. The SEC complaint alleges that JBI raised over $8 million for the company in these pipes just before the company issued a public statement indicating its financial statements could no longer be relied upon. The controversy centers on the erroneous valuation of certain assets, known as media credits, on the company's balance sheet. In contravention to U.S. GAAP, the Commission alleges that JBI erroneously booked the media credits at a value of almost $10 million, thereby becoming the single largest asset on the company's balance sheet when they should have been initially booked at the value of $1 million when they were acquired in August of 2009. Subsequently, the media credits should have been remeasured at their current value and written down to zero as of the end of the company's third fiscal quarter on September 30, 2009. Now, I do want to ask you about JBI, Marta, but 
before we get to the allegations in the SEC complaint, I just want to make sure, since this is a complaint by the staff of the SEC, it hasn't been reviewed by the full commission or by any court of law, has it? That's correct, Mike, and we need to be cautious when we look at a complaint like that because, you know, there are allegations, they still need to be proven, and depending on the actual judicial proceeding, that all of those facts will get decided either by a jury or by the finder of fact, the court. So we can talk about, you know, a, a hypothetical with that type of um, set of facts, but we just need to be cautious that there has been no finding of, of any wrongdoing at all at this time. Well, in this fact pattern or in a similar set of facts, the alleged securities and accounting fraud involves overstating the actual value of assets and misrepresenting the value of the company. I'm curious, how common are these situations? Well, Mike, in an economic downturn, you do find uh, that the risk of fraudulent misstatements increase. And the reason for that is, is because people are in, in, in harm's way in terms of either violating dead covenants or having a problem with their liquidity or being worried about the survival of their business in general. And so sometimes they will resort to using those um, means as a way to keep the company afloat or uh, avoiding a debt covenant default, which would accelerate their debt. So there are certain circumstances, or they want additional capital, or they want to grow their business, and what they decide is the only way to do that is to go use somebody else's money to generate that uh, opportunity for them. So in, in, in a case like this, where you have a company that was acquiring what I would call um, uh, intangible assets to be able to expand their business, there's a greater risk for, for fraud in those types of cases. And the reason is because the valuation of intangible assets is a very, very subjective, very subjective call. Uh, it, it requires you to think about the likelihood of you being able to use that asset in the future and the development of assumptions of how those assets are going to get used. At the time this particular set of facts arose, they were in a situation where the literature didn't necessarily require you to come up with an appraisal. So there was some judgment, I assume, just again, based on what I see, by the acquiring company not to do a valuation. From my perspective, I would have done the valuation because if it was the most significant asset, and quite frankly, it appeared to it might have been the only asset that the company had, it would have protected the company's financial officer, the operating officer who both certify to the SEC, and the board. And so it, it seems to me that inadequate due diligence um, might, might have occurred. And so therefore, in, if I were looking in hindsight, which is always lovely to do in these in circumstances, you know, you definitely want to have an appraisal. You definitely want to have due diligence done on the company and the assets. And you also have got a responsibility that, you know, you've got what you were willing to pay for that asset at the time. And that is a very good indicator of what the value was to the company. And that was ignored. Okay, they purchased these intangible assets. So what difference does it make, or does it make a difference, whether JBI purchased those media credits with cash or with its own stock? No, it really doesn't, because you know, you're looking at a total indication of what you believe the value to be. And you know, in, in, a, in a transaction, it's what a willing seller is willing to pay and a willing buyer is willing to accept, and you're going to look at the forms of compensation in that regard. But you also have a responsibility immediately thereafter, once you've established that, that economic value, that if for some reason you have knowledge that your asset is valued at an amount that it is impossible to recover, you have an obligation to recognize the impairment of that asset, and you've got to make sure that you do that. You mentioned that the company was seeking additional capital, so let me ask you uh, another one of those on the one hand questions, Marta. On the one hand, JBI itself issued a public announcement that its financial statements could no longer be relied upon. But on the other hand, that announcement was made after JBI raised over $8 million in several private capital raising efforts known as pipes. Would that raise a red flag for the SEC? Yes, it would. Clearly, again, the, the fact that they had um, relied upon an asset valuation that later on became uh, at, at issue it really will cause the SEC to look at the nature of the circumstances and the timing of whether that transaction or that revaluation of the asset should have occurred before the, um, the actual uh, capital instruments were, were offered to the market. And that'll be, you know, that, that would be an issue regardless of whether the SEC were looking 
at the case or not. Any, any company that is going to be going through any capital raise, whether it be debt or equity, has to really be very cautious about taking a second look at the valuation of all of its um, intangible assets or anything that uh, has substantial judgment and making sure that disclosures are adequate. I know that the SEC, Mike, from the perspective of reviewing their disclosures as the, the debt or capital raise will, going through that process will look, but, but management should, you know, sharpen their pencils and make sure that they've done everything that they can. And certainly, if an event occurs subsequent to the time they make that offering, they're going to do their best to, to evaluate that in light of whether there should be any adjustments made. Well, since you mentioned the company's management, Marta, I noticed that in its complaint, the SEC is also charging JBI's current CEO as well as its former CFO. Now, I'm curious, how common is it to name a corporate financial executive in an SEC action? My clients do ask me that question a lot. I, you know, they get very frustrated with why the SEC picks on corporate executives. And the, the challenge is they look at the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley requirements for certification pretty rigorously. And when you sign on a line that is dotted every quarter and on an annual basis, uh, they take that, that certification very seriously. And so that's how they make it stick, is, is when, when there are situations that that certification has been signed and representations are revised, you know, the SEC will hold people accountable. And, that, and that's, that's a tough thing. That's tough. I would think that that would cause me, if I were sitting in my client's shoes, to make me think twice when I sign that certification. Speaking of financial executives, let me ask you about the level of financial advice that JBI was receiving. At the time, they acquired the media credits. The company hired a so-called accounting consultant, even though that individual was not a CPA and did not have a formal accounting degree. Is that suspicious? That is, Mike, in my mind, something that if in any circumstance where you're trying to value a complex and unusual instrument, you would want to go to somebody that has credentials and the experience to do it. And in today's world, the nice thing is there's a lot of qualified people that do valuation of the type of instruments that we're talking about here. So they had an opportunity to pick somebody that would have known a lot about those types of instruments, and yet, and yet it, it, it's concerning that you would choose somebody that, that wouldn't have the experience. So just keep that in mind as to, to actually try to seek those experts out, and, and they're, they're out there, so they'll, they'll be helpful to an entity. Although JBI has moved to Canada, this case took place primarily here in the U.S. Yet these days, our viewers' organizations, like the capital markets themselves, operate across borders. To what extent is securities enforcement primarily an American concern? I don't think it's just an American concern, because I think, Mike, that many of the other markets are looking to continue to expand their ability to offer global financing. And in order to have global financing, you have to have great transparency and consistent standards. I think you see the United States working with other countries to try to have common accounting principles. They're talking about having common certifications for accountants. So you're going to continue to see more and more that there's going to be an, an elevation and a standardization of that playing field across everybody. I think it, it is no small coincidence that the SEC is involved in driving the United States to using IFRS and deciding the timetable. That tells you how important our credibility is in providing valuable, uh, transparent financial information, not only within the U.S., but to the community at large globally. I suppose one of the SEC's concerns has been the fact that the framework for securities regulation in many other countries is still in development. Does that also make sense to you, Marta? Yes, it does. I think that the globalization of business is still evolving and is still developing other nations' regulatory frameworks. The first step to that you've seen, and it's been successful, is in the FCPA, where other countries have stepped up and put in place regulatory structures and laws to support the fact that certain types of conduct will not be tolerated. I think you're going to see more of that with respect to a regulatory framework on the security side, because I think in order for markets to be as liquid as the, what the U.S. enjoys, you're going to need to have more of that information. In order for capital to move more quickly and to permit more efficient due diligence, you've got to have the transparency, Mike, and I think that will happen over time. A few minutes ago, Marta, you reminded me how important the value of intangible assets is to companies these days. 
Obviously, no business wants to see their corporate name or the name of their top executives in a front page story in the Wall Street Journal or in an SEC complaint. What can organizations and their corporate financial executives do to minimize the possibility that they will find their corporate names in the headlines or in SEC proceedings? You know, Mike, I will tell you that my clients ask me that all the time because they're always worried about what they don't expect to hit them that can. I will tell you a couple of things. First is that you need to have a robust risk assessment program going on within the company that identifies the potential risks of where your reputation could be damaged. Secondly, you have to develop programs and measurements around those concerns to monitor whether, where either risks are occurring or where there's opportunities for training or controls that make sense within a business that are cost effective to put those in place. And third, we can't plan for everything in life. There are things that will happen that we would have never predicted or that would be an evolution of business that was something that we weren't aware of. So we have to have a, a good reaction program, what people would call a crisis management program. I think of more like a, a PR type program so that you'd be prepared to have a team of people in the company that are not only experts at communicating, but also have the passion of the business at heart to come up with the right responses. And having that team, having them be together, practice that process, it will make it effective for them in the event that anything ever occurred. But most, by and large, good companies that do the right thing typically don't have that problem. Well, I see that you brought your crystal ball with you today, Marta. So let me ask you, in terms of SEC enforcement actions, do you expect 2012 to turn out to be as hectic as 2011 was? Mike, I do. I think that you're going to see additional interest in the valuation arena. I think we're not going to see um, as many financial services cases, but they will stay strong on the valuation type issues. They will stay strong on um, looking at uh, financial fraud, making sure that people are accounting for their um, revenue transactions appropriately, and I don't think they're going to let up. Well, you certainly covered a wide range of topics for us today, Marta. If our viewers could take one thought away from this discussion, what would you like that to be? Uh, applying uh, common sense and due diligence to transactions that you're evaluating is extremely important. Think about it always from the standpoint of stepping outside yourself and the company and looking in. And what would you advise? If you were the advisor, what would you advise your company to do on an independent basis? And then follow that advice in whatever you do. MBAF's Marta Alfonso, thanks for bringing us up to date on the SEC. I hope you come back and join us again soon. Thank you so much, Mike. I'd enjoy that very much. And thank you to all your viewers as well.